Um, this is from Luke 16, verses 15. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Brother, it's good to have you back. And Renee as well. Welcome. Thank you. for a class and we went by and visited Christian it doesn't seem to be working there it goes it just came on it just came on I don't know if the kept pushing the button and it finally came on so that's a good thing but uh, we were in Nebraska I was taking a class to get my master's in, Divin in uh, Christian pastoral ministry and I went to visit Christian Record Braille and <laughs> I went in there, and of course, most of what they do now is electronic, uh, and people can just pop in CDs or whatever they, they're doing now. And they went back and took me into the warehouse and showed me around, and they showed me, one of the reasons they're doing that, they showed me a Braille Bible, a full Braille Bible. The thing was about that high, about that big, and about... <laughs> about that long. It was gigantic. I said, I don't know if anybody could pick, pick that up. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine holding something that big in your lap? But, and so that's why they've gone digital, because it's, it's very expensive and it's cumbersome to be using that. I'm glad to be back here among friends and family. Uh, family, excuse me. Get tongue-tied once in a while. <laughs> but uh, so glad to be back. Um, pray for me. The church in Statesville has asked me to do a mini evangelistic meeting. So I'll be doing that at the end of September. Um, our, uh, my sermon today is, ties along with the text we read. Why do you, you, or why do you think you're esteemed? Or why are you esteemed? Why do you think that? Um, and so we're going to start back and look at that verse. He says the things that the world esteems is an abomination to God. What does the world esteem? Money. money. Yeah, money, power, fame, and all that to God, there's no humility in any of that. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching the Olympics. Some of the people almost die to get that gold medal or even a bronze. And then what frustrates me is there's some that don't seem like they care. You know, they're up in the pack, and they're running around the track, and next thing you know, they're way back. It's like they just gave up. And, you know, Jesus is probably saying, there'll be another day. But there's so many of them that their pride is so much, they come out there and they're beating their chest, and they're thinking how great they are, and then they get beat. And uh, it seems like it happens that way a lot. So, as we look at that, I want to look at another text so we can get some background. It's found in Luke 15, and it's verses 1 and 2. By this time, Jesus, the scribes and Pharisees are having a problem with Jesus. You know, it's gotten worse and worse. And, and now it says in verse 1, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near Jesus to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to complain, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. About like if you were here for Sabbath school lesson. Oh, I can't believe he's around a sinner. He's around somebody that's going to defile him. How could Jesus do this? If he thinks he's the Messiah, he's got another thing coming, right? He's got it all mixed up. He's got it wrong. And they were getting more angry and angry at him because... Instead of him telling them, he was showing them. This is what you should be doing. And it was making them upset because it was making them look bad. And he wasn't following their counsel or their teachings. 
So I'd like to share a story with you. And we're all probably familiar with, her, with it. It's Luke 18, chapter 18. And it's the Pharisee and the tax collector starting in verse 9. And I believe this is Jesus' response to this because the best way you can usually teach somebody or reach somebody is through a story. I think of David, you know, when he had sinned and Nathan came in and didn't say, you've committed sin, he came in and told him a story. Got his attention. And then David was wanted to stand up for that person. He said, well, you're the one. <laughs> and I believe that's what he's trying to do here with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the tax collector, I mean, to other people. Now, he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. I hope we don't do that. Uh, we talked about that earlier, about homeless and other people that uh, are, you feel uncomfortable around. And there are people in the world do make me feel uncomfortable. I'll be honest. I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to go down a dark alley when there's a whole, about five or six people down there. I mean, that, makes, that, that would make me feel really uncomfortable. But I knew a pastor one time. We were at a park, and all these bikers come up. And, you know, when they come up, they're noisy. Most of them have Harleys. And they look, and they're dressed the part, right? Yeah, you know, they got these leather jackets on. They're sleeveless. So they got tattoos. Their their hair is long. And you know what he did? Instead of avoiding them, he went straight up to them and started talking to them about Jesus. That's the way it should be, right? So it says there were two men went into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began praying in this this regard to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Now, of course, who's the other people he's talking about? He says right here, even like this tax collector. So he's walked in and he's and he signaled somebody out, right? <laughs> okay, there's a there's a really bad sinner. <laughs> so I'm going to compare myself to him. That's when we get in trouble. So we try to compare ourselves to other people. It, we, we are doing it for the purpose of trying to make ourselves feel good or better to uh, build our ego up. That we're not so bad after all. But if we really understand ourselves and compare ourselves to Jesus, we all realize how short we've come. So he's comparing himself to this tax collector, which of course tax collectors they considered to be sinners. Because tax collectors were considered traitors. They were working for the Roman government, collecting money from the Jewish people to give to Rome. And so they, were, they really hated... I think that's so amazing that Jesus picked Matthew Levi. I mean, imagine what the other disciples thought. You're picking him? <laughs> Don't you know what he does for a living? <laughs> but he saw something in Matthew that other people didn't. So he goes on and he says, I fast, he starts giving his reasons. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But this tax collector was standing some distance away. And you know, they both were both standing away from people. The Pharisee here is standing away because he don't want to be contaminated. He don't want anybody that's a sinner to come around near him because he's, he's got it made. He's got it right. And the tax collector is just the opposite. He knows he's a sinner. He knows that he's, he's come short. And he's standing some distance away, even unwilling to raise his eyes towards heaven, but beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. In those times, people didn't normally beat their chest the only one that usually would would be a, a female at usually a funeral. And that's when they would beat their chest. So it's highly unusual for him to do what he's doing. But it's because he feels so uh, hurt and troubled by the fact that he is a sinner. That he knows just how much he needs a Savior. And Jesus then ends this parable this way. I tell you that this man went to his house justified rather than the other one. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So we're going to leap off there, and we're going to look through the Bible 
at different parts. The good news for all of us is, is Hebrews 7.25, that Jesus is in heaven interceding for our, on our behalf. And it's a good thing that Jesus does that because sometimes we don't even know we need help. And he's up there praying for us about the things that we don't realize that we need the help from him. Because I've seen my prayers answered that I wasn't even asking for. And like something would happen in my life that I really needed to happen, but I wasn't praying about it. And all of a sudden the answer came and I knew that God had given the answer before I even said anything. We must know our real condition. Each one of us here must understand who we really are. And righteousness is always a saving gift from God. It's not anything we can earn. It's not something that we can do to merit our value with God because God sees everyone the same. He looks at us and He sees us as all sinners in need of a Savior. The only thing that can make a difference is if we accept Jesus as our Savior. Then he sees us like Christ. Each day Paul would say, I die daily. Because Paul understood that even though he was this great evangelist, he's reaching lots of people, he still needed Jesus. He still fell short. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, it's talking to... Our church at the end of time. And he's saying to us, he says, Because you say, I am rich. Are we rich in this country? We are. We're very rich. Now, some of us probably don't feel so rich. <laughs> you might have a lot of bills that's hanging over your head, and, and you're thinking, man, I, I, just, I don't feel rich. I feel like I'm in debt up to my, up to my neck, and I'm about to drown. Uh, but if you look at us compared to other countries, you know, they'll work a whole month uh, to get what we get in maybe an hour. It's just the, the, the discrepancy that's in the world is interesting. But we say we're rich, and we have become wealthy and have need of anything. I hope none of us feels that way, but he's telling us that we're that way because... We look and we've, we've got the Bible. Everyone of us here probably has a Bible. We're part of a church. We do things and we don't feel too bad about ourselves most of the time. But he advises in verse 18, he says not only, well after he says don't need anything, he says, do you not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked? I advise you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may be clothed yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve that you may be able to see. So God sees us as we really are. Most times we don't. We look in the mirror and we, we look pretty good. Or if we don't, our wife will tell us, well, this hair's out of place. Or, uh, you know, <laughs> or my wife will say, you need to go get a haircut. You let it grow as long as you can let it grow because I don't get a haircut until she says that because I'm trying to save money. And when she says I need a haircut, I, I know that means I really need a haircut. Uh, but, you know, we have the tendency to think that you look around and, you know, people have problems. And you see people that have outward problems, like maybe they're an alcoholic, or maybe they're a chain smoker. And you, and you can almost think of yourself being like the Pharisee. I'm glad, Lord, I'm not like him. I'm not addicted. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm glad I don't smoke all the time and get lung cancer. But does that make you better than him? No, it doesn't. But yet we have that tendency as human beings. Because we look at others and we say, well, think about it this way. When a pastor comes, I heard you don't have a pastor right now, right? When he comes for the first year, he'll be on a honeymoon with your church. And after that year, sometimes it's sooner, but usually within a year, the honeymoon's over. And then you can let your real feelings out. And you can tell him what it's like. And you can tell him where he's wrong and what he's doing wrong. But in the beginning, you accept almost everything he says. Uh, what's the change? The change is you've gotten used to him. 
you've got to know who he is. And he's just as bad as the rest of us. So, you know, just that's the way it is. The standard, though, is God. When we look at Jesus and compare ourselves to Jesus, how do we look? That should humble us right away. I don't know about you. I don't... I, <laughs> you know, with the Holy Spirit's help, I could. But, I mean, think of myself being on a cross and suffering like He went. That, that just blows my mind. I don't know. It just shows you how much He loves us. The Pharisee stands apart. He doesn't want to be ceremonially unclean. He's bold. He's confident. He's grateful in himself and what he does. He looks around at everybody else and makes sure they're looking at him when he prays. He wears long robes, is what Jesus said. And they love, they love to stand on street corners and say, look at me, look at me how righteous I am. We don't have anybody like that here, I hope. But we can have that tendency. The public, uh, the tax collector prays, and he prays for mercy. And what's interesting, when you look up the original Greek of that word, it means make atonement for me. That's what he really said. He didn't say have mercy. He said, make atonement for me. I need something that's going to cleanse me. I need something that's going to change me. Something that's going to make me a different person. Because I know how wretched and miserable and poor I am. I think of, um, of us, or things that we think may make us right with God, that gives us merit, that makes us look improved. You know, when you think of the ladder that goes to heaven, we're all on different rungs. The problem is sometimes you go up one and you slip two back, or you go up two and you slip one back. Uh, it, it's a continual s struggle to keep going up because our problem is our human heart is prideful. And I don't know about you, but I, be, I try to ask my neighbors if I can help them. And they'll like, oh no, I don't need your help. I asked the lady across the street, you want me to come cut your grass? Oh, no, 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 I don't need that. I've got a nephew that will do it. Don't, don't worry about me. And I said, i got my push lawnmower. Just come over and swipe it over there. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, lady down the street, they were struggling. They had this huge box. I don't know what it was in it. I think it was flooring. Yeah, flooring can get heavy. And... Is probably those, uh, what, is it, what do we have, Renee? Laminated. The laminated, yeah, it's probably those. Those are heavy. And, and her and her daughter, she's got a teenage daughter, and she's, she's not married, and they're trying to get it up the steps. And I see them doing this. And, and they're having a hard time. So I run over there, and I say, let me help. And I grab the end, and I pick it up, and they went, wow. I wasn't trying to do it to make myself look good. I was just trying to help. I got it up the steps, and then I was getting ready to take it in the house, and they go, oh no, you can just leave it here. I kept wondering, what's in that house? <laughs> what, did, what don't you want me to see? <laughs> you know, is there somebody tied up in there? What, what's going on? Uh, that just confused me. I, I thought she'd want me to bring it all the way in so it'd be easier for her. But she said, no, just leave it here. We'll get it. Because people don't like you to help them. I, it frustrates me. I um, I don't know. I just because I try to help people and it's like they don't want me to. Uh, I surprised a neighbor of mine because she has these azaleas, and you know how if you don't trim them, they'll get uh, they'll get big and they'll get out. You know, she had a couple of them next to her window and in her side of her house, and they were huge. And so I said, you know, I'll come over and trim those one day. Well, she never said yes or no. She didn't say anything. Well, one morning I went over there and I'm clip, 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 clip. And all of a sudden she's, she hears this noise in the house. She comes out and tells me, I heard this noise. I looked out the front door. I didn't see anybody. So I went around the back door and I looked out there. I didn't see anybody. But I could still hear the noise. And I thought, what is going on? She finally went around the side of the house where I was. And she says, oh, you're cutting my azaleas. <laughs> and I said, I hope it's right what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can ask for forgiveness, you know, after I do it, right? It, it, it's a little hard, you know, to change once you've cut something off. You can't glue it back. It's not going to work that way. But, you know, she's an elderly woman, 
and she's a widow, and she can't do things like she used to. She just had a heart attack. And so she puts her trash cans out, or I guess her children probably put their trash cans out. And then when the trash man comes around and I put mine up, I go run over there and I put hers up. And she goes, did you put my trash can up the other day? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> so we're ma- I'm making fr- tr- friends with her, but it's not easy. Uh, I gave her a book and she says, is this written by Seven Day of Venice? I said, yeah, but I'm not trying to convert you. I just, I just thought you might like to read it. Oh, okay. And so she started reading it. So who knows what will happen. Uh, her husband was a Baptist uh, pastor, so you can sort of understand that she's got that connection. Um, but do we sometimes think, because we're baptized, that we've got it made? Or that because we have membership in the church, it gives us a leg up on other people? Or that we keep the Sabbath? You know, we always talk about the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath, the Sabbath. All these other churches don't keep the Sabbath. But does that really give us any value? It it doesn't, does it? But yet we'll use those things and we'll talk about them in ways that it sounds like it, it does. Maybe we don't mean that, but it comes across that way. Do our works. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I'm doing all this for the church, or... I had one lady one time, we were having an evangelistic meeting, and the lady that was taking care of the young kids didn't show up. She couldn't come. I don't know what happened. And I went back and I asked her. I said, would you come in and help with the kids tonight? And she goes, Pastor, I've done my duty. I'm not working with kids anymore. And I went, what? (laughs) I didn't know there was a time limit on it. You know, of doing good works that you can only do so many, and then you reach enough, you're done. I mean, it confused me, but that was the answer I got, so who had to go back there? It was me. I had to go back there because nobody else wanted to go back there. The evangelist out there preaching, I'm in the back playing with the kids. I guess that's where God wanted me. I, I don't know. Or, or do we look at other people's bad habits and we thank God that we're not like them? You know, they're eating pork or, or they're smoking or they're drinking or they gossip. And I don't do that. Well, I had a lady come up to me the other day and said, well, I, I don't gossip. She says, what I tell is the truth. <laughs> and I said, well, then you don't understand what gossip is. <laughs> gossip doesn't mean it's a lie. It just means you're talking about somebody. And, and you don't need to keep talking about them all the time, right? Who should we be talking about? Jesus, right? And if you're talking about somebody else, then your mind is somewhere else. Uh, maybe your position in the church. You know, we're looked up as pastors, elders, deacons, people, deaconesses that are leaders in the church. And, and I hear that in church all the time. The leaders of the church. And yet, if you're really a leader of the church, you actually, as you get promoted up the scale, you should become more and more of a servant. It gives you more responsibility to serve people. And as a pastor, that's what you do. You're serving people. You're trying to help them. Uh, Maybe it's uh, that you understand the Word better than other people. I mean, there's a lady that we're studying with, and she's a very nice lady, her and her husband. They've been Adventists. I don't really know how long, but they don't know the Bible. Isn't that sad? Adventists today don't know the Bible like they used to. And so I've been working with two or three different people trying to help them understand Scripture better. But I don't go around and say, well, I know it better than she does. No, I don't do that. But the problem comes, it's like I told her last night we were studying. I said, when you read the Scriptures, you might not get it the first time. You might not get it the second time. But as you read it, you pick up little things all along the way. And each time you read it, you get more. And what you're doing is you're storing it in your memory banks. So when God needs you to say something, it's there so He can pull it out. I know I've witnessed the people and Scripture just pop in my head. And I know it's Him doing it because I'm like, I didn't even think of saying that. It just just comes out. It's happened when I've preached before. Things have come in my brain. My wife said, I need to think before I speak. (laughs) But things will come in my brain and it just comes out, you know. Uh, and I've, I have a problem with that in church sometimes. 
People will laugh, but Renee goes, oh, you shouldn't have said that. Um, she tries to keep me on the straight and narrow. And thank God for wives. Um, or maybe it's that we can teach the Sabbath school lesson like you did today. Or maybe it's that we can preach and preach so much better because, um, you know, it's amazing. Some people don't think they can do stuff in the church until, you, until they do it. There was a lady in our church that said, I can't preach, I can't teach, and yet she does the Sabbath school superintendent thing every, you know, every month, once a month. And she does a great job of it. So I sort of twisted her arm and said, why don't you teach the Sabbath school class? I'll just, we'll just do it every two months. She does a great job. But she didn't think she could do it. And I think a lot of us are in that boat. We don't think we can do what I'm doing. Or we don't think we can do what somebody else is doing. And we think that makes us less valuable to God. But it doesn't. God just wants us to be available and willing. I had a lady at church when I was down in Waycross, and she says, she used to be uh, the secretary for personal ministries, and she had done that for years, and she said, I can't do anything anymore, because they took her out of the office because she started getting feeble. And she says, I just can't do anything. I have no talents, no gifts, and she's just going on. And I said, uh, could you uh, send cards to those that are sick or, or bereaving or anything like that? Yeah, I could do that. So she started doing that. You know, it, it, you got to look. You, you can't do this. Find something else, right? There's always something you can do to encourage people. Or maybe we think because... I haven't seen this in any of these churches around here, but I'm sure there's some like that, where there's somebody rich in the church, and they always let you sort of know that they're giving to help fund this project or help build the church. Well, I gave $30,000 to build this church. <laughs> this is my church. I had, a, I had a church one time told me that. This is our church. We built this church. And I was like, I don't think it's in your name. I think it's in the conference's name. <laughs> so, whose church is it, right? It's the conferences. It's not ours. I mean, the, church wanted, the conference wanted to shut this down. They could shut it down. But they give it up to us to manage, just like God gives us money and talents for us to manage for Him. With all that said, I want to look at uh, Romans because Paul tackles this issue in Romans chapter 1 uh, through 3. We'll start off in the beginning looking at the first seven verses just because Paul's given an introduction here and he's given an introduction to the gospel. And he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So the first thing you see right here, the gospel is from God. It's not something, he's the author, he's the one that decided it. We're told in scriptures from the foundation of the world, he had this plan set in motion. At Genesis 3.15, after they had sinned, God comes and gives them a promise. And He says, the serpent's going to bite his heel, but he's going to crush the serpent's head. I mean, you're never going to catch God off guard where He's going to go. Somebody's praying and say, Oh Lord, Sister Mary is so sick. Could you help her? And He's up there going, Oh, I didn't know that. I wish you had told me earlier. You know, He knows it. He knew it before it was going to happen, right? And so God made contingencies because He knows what could happen or what is going to happen. The second one in verse 2, um, it says, which He promised beforehand through His prophets and the Holy Scriptures. So it tells us that the Gospel was prophesied about in the Old Testament. Again, it's not something an afterthought. It was something that was looked forward to. In verse 3, it says, concerning His Son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. So he's saying the gospel has to deal with the fact that Jesus is human. He became one of us so that we have a high priest that can sympathize with our weaknesses. He knew what it was like to get tired. He knew what it was like to get hungry. Remember when he went to the well 
in Samaria. And he says, and he sat down because he was tired. And the disciples went on and he, he waited there. But he had a divine appointment of coming. So Jesus knows our weaknesses. He knows what we go through. And he has the power to help us to get over those weaknesses. It's called the Holy Spirit that he sends us. Our comforter, our helper. And he says, I've got it all under control, just trust me. The problem is I don't think we trust him a lot. <laughs> we try to do it ourselves and then, it, then we fail and finally we go, Lord help me. But the problem is we don't always give it all, do we? We, we give nine tenths maybe. And it's just like in giving tithe. The lady the other day I was studying with, she says, I give my 10%. And I said, well, yeah, but there's more than just the 10%. There's offerings. And I don't, some of our people in our church were trying to figure out why we got a whole bunch of new members. And all of a sudden, the offerings have gone down. Tithe has stayed up where it was, but offerings have gone down. And I think it's because of a misunderstanding of tithe and offerings, what they're about. They don't really understand what they're used for. In verse 4, it says, who was declared the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So right there he's saying that Jesus is divine. So he's saying the gospel is about Jesus who's human and divine. He can take care of us. Verse 5, it says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of of faith among all the Gentiles in behalf of His name. He's telling us there the gospel has the power to change us. That we can be obedient and do what He's asking us to do. Not on our own strength, but by the strength that He gives us. Yeah, how many times have you heard people say, well, I just can't do it. Uh, my dad smoked. I don't know how many... I don't know if it was 30 years, 40 years. I don't remember. He smoked a long time. And when he tried to quit, he tried and he tried and he tried. But finally, he quit. He did stop. And that's the same way in Christi Christianity. If we're having a trouble with something in our lives, and I don't know what all your problems are, but I know every one of us here has problems. <laughs> but if, if you've got problems in your life, keep trying. Keep trying. And keep praying. Keep asking. And you'll be amazed. I, I, when, I became a, when I went into the ministry, my friends from back in Delaware that I grew up with would meet my mom, and they'd say, Curtis is doing what? What's he doing? They, they, were, they were dumbfounded. Him? Because that's not me. That wasn't what I was. I hated to speak in front of people. And I told people, I said, I'll never sell anything and I'll never talk in public. And God heard me say that. And what did God do? He made me a literature evangelist and then a pastor. So he says, okay, you can't do it, but I can, right? And that's what it is with us. We can't overcome, but we can overcome through Jesus. And we just have to keep trying. Don't never give up. God's eventually going to make us overcomers. And then verse 6 to 7, he says, Among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. To all the beloved in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says the gospel's for everyone. It's for the Gentiles and the Jews, and that's the issue he's dealing with at Rome. The Gentiles and the Jews, and they're not really getting along real well. And we have that issue in our church, don't we? We have the vegans and the non-vegans. <laughs> uh, have you ever been at Potluck and they go, is that vegan? Is, I had a lady, a family in our church, and they had to go around. Is that vegan? Is that vegan? You know, and I'm like, let's start putting labels on it so I don't, I don't, we don't have to answer her. That, I mean, it just sounds bad when we've got guests there and the ladies going around pointing out what's in that dish. Uh, you don't need to be doing that. That's just, just uh, I don't know. It's crazy how that we think the things we do, which are important, but they're not. 
They are salvational too, but they don't give us salvation. They're because we have salvation. It's a, we try to put the, the, the horse or the buggy before the horse, you know, and we put the buggy out, which are the works, and the horse is supposed to be leading it, which is Christ, and it's behind it. And so we get it mixed up and in the wrong order. And I think that's what a lot of those people do. And I don't see nothing wrong with being a vegan. I was a vegan for six years. I think it's good if you can do it. But when I became a pastor, I was going to people's house and they were offering me cheese almost every house I went to. And I said, this ain't working. <laughs> I said, I feel like I keep refusing what they're giving me and I have to explain myself every home I'm going to. And so I said, yeah. <laughs> so I became a vegetarian. So, um, uh, yeah, there's something in cheese that makes you want to eat it again. Uh, just like ice cream, you know. You eat ice cream and you want more. It's just uh, something about it. And I, I don't know if it... I don't think that was God's plan. I think God's plan is for us to want... Uh, be temperate. You know. Then in verse 16 and 17, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. You know, some people were ashamed of it. How could Jesus die on a tree? You know, that was called that you were cursed. So some Jews looked at it that way. The Romans thought it's crazy that man, God would come down and be man. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone. That means all of us here who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. From faith to faith is present tense. It's saying it's an ongoing thing. It, it, your faith has got to be a daily exercise. It's just like when you, you ever work out. What happens when you don't work out for a couple months? And then you go back and try to work out. <gasps> I used to be able to do, to do this. <laughs> You've got to work back up to it. Now my wife, I hate picking on her, but she, she knows me. Uh, <laughs> Her problem, I'm going to be candid, her problem is when she goes back to work out, she tries to do what she did two months ago. And she's like, <laughs> and then she's, oh, I can't do anything. For three or four days, she can't do anything because she's done too much starting back. And she keeps like, it's almost like a roller coaster that she's on. And you know, She starts working out and then she takes a break. And then she starts working out and takes a break. And she's now going through therapy, so hopefully they're doing water therapy with her which I think is great because she comes, she says, I did everything they asked me to do. And then she'll come home, oh, I'm hurting. Because <laughs> you're in the water, you don't feel it. <laughs> so she's there exercising away. And I'm hoping that eventually she'll come home one day and go, I'm not hurting anymore. So hopefully she'll get to that point. And then look out, right? She's got a neighbor down the street she's made friends with. That, well, I made friends first, but I don't want to take credit because she wound up becoming friends with her and then ask her if they could start walking around together. So she's got a connection there that she can grow. Um, then verse 20, it says this, For since the creation of the world, for His invisible attributes, that is, His eternal power and His divine nature have been clearly perceived, being understood by what He has made, so that they are without excuse. Hmm. Can you understand why Satan wanted to bring evolution in? Because if God didn't make it, then you're not seeing God, what He can do. And they think, and look at the next verse coming down, it's verse uh, 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. How many times you hear people on the TV, if you ever watch these nature shows, Billions and billions of years ago, this animal crawled up out of the ocean, slugged along, and got legs because he had to, because he couldn't move otherwise. And you know, next thing you know, he's got he's standing on two feet, and uh, it's a crazy theory. And yet, in school, they're teaching it as fact. It's no longer a theory; it's a fact. And I'm like, how can it be a fact? I said, you're supposed to be seeing God in it, but what you're seeing is us in it, that we've, we're the ones that are becoming better. 
not that God's doing it. And that's the problem with our society today. It's all about us. We all feel entitled because, you know, we need to be given this because we're worthy to get this stuff. And in reality, none of us are worthy, are we? We all fall short. Um, Verse 24, what does God do when that happens? When people uh, turn against Him. Well, the Israelites, He took them into captivity, but here's what it says, verse 24. Therefore God gave them up to their vile impurity and their lusts and their hearts so their bodies would be dishonored among them. God gives us up to whatever our evil desires are. If we continually want that, and turn our back from God, He's eventually going to say, okay, that's what you want. You're going to get what you want. And then you get the consequences. It could be HIV. It could be uh, sexually transmitted disease, um, cancer, whatever. In verse 26, He goes on with the same reasoning. He says, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged natural relationships for that which is contrary to nature. Well, you see that promoted on TV all the time now. I mean, I don't know how many, We like watching cooking shows. And I don't know how many times there's somebody on there that just talks like this. And I was like, how, how come his voice is... Everyone you meet, almost their voice is almost always that way. And I'm like, how come that is? And I can't understand it. So it confuses me. Uh, but, but you see him promoted. You'll see him kiss each other on a show. You'd be watching a show and it seems to be a good show. Next thing you know, two guys are hugging and kissing and I'm like, where'd that come from? It's that uh, They've got an agenda that they're trying to push. They want you to say, okay, they're alright. They're, they're just like me. There's nothing different about them. They're acceptable and if we don't tolerate them and accept them the way they are, then we're the ones that are wrong. And yet God says they're not supposed to do this. It's unnatural. It's not something that... (laughs) Women are not supposed to love women and men are not supposed to love men. That's not natural. God didn't make us that way. He didn't create two Adams or two Eves. He created Adam and Eve. But yet, they think they're so smart that they have twisted what the Scriptures say. And they've come up with what they think, what they want to be right. Verse 28... And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to deprived mind to do those things that are not proper. You know, if you turn from God, God's going to eventually say, okay. He's going to still try to reach them. You know, because that's the loving God we have. But He's going to let us suffer the consequences of our actions. If you do something, you can't expect God to get up there and go, I'm going to fix all this. I'm going to take all this away. I mean, Paul had bad eyesight his whole life because he was chasing and killing Christians. And God let it happen to him. And when he healed him, he didn't give him complete victory. And remember, Paul says, he says, I asked three times that I would be healed. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. God allowed that to happen to Paul. Then, let's look at Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore you have no excuse, you foolish person. Every one of you who passes judgment, for in that matter in which you judge someone else, you condemn yourself, for you judge the practice and practice the same. Wow. Um, In verse 21 is an example of that as he's going through chapter 2. He says, You therefore who teach someone else... Do you not teach yourself? That's a rhetorical question. He said you're supposed to be teaching yourself. When you're telling somebody about the Sabbath, you're supposed to be keeping the Sabbath, right? But he goes on and he says, um, You who preach that one is not to steal, do you steal? Remember that was the problem they had in Malachi. He says, you robbed me. And he says, where did we rob you? And he says, you're not paying tithe and offerings. How many times have you heard people say, I can't afford to pay tithe and offerings? Or they say, well, I give 10%, but I said, there's more than that. You're still robbing God. God wants you to give a generous free will offering. Uh, Be generous. And people don't get that. They want to hold on to it for themselves. 
A lady the other day asked me, she said, how come all these people that have these needs keep coming to me? Well, <laughs> I don't know. There must be a reason God's sending them to you because <laughs> you know, either you're good with advice or God wants you to give to them. I don't know what it is, but you're going to have to read. And I told her a couple sections in the Bible to read. Uh, verse 25. Then he starts talking about circumcision. He says, For indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a violator of the law, your circumcision has turned into uncircumcision. If you're going to say, well, I'm going to do everything right, then you've got to do it perfect. That's what he's saying. You know, with us. If we're going to be perfect seven-day at Venice, then we've got to never break anything. And then, of course, we, be, we become non-seven-day Venice or non-Christians because we break. And then we ask for forgiveness and he brings us back in. It's about reconciling ourselves to him. And it's uh, the thing that I like, Ellen White says, it's not the daily thing. She, God looks at our life in whole. Are we progressing closer to Jesus? Or are we going the other way? That's what he mainly looks at. Because <laughs> Anthony Campolo, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, he had this meeting he was holding, and these hippies come walking in. And they sat down on the front row. And he, at the end of his ta talk, it was more like a teaching thing, he said, are there any questions? And of course, the hippie raised his hand up. And he goes, Alfie, what's it all about? And he, and he thought, he said to him, well, that's a good question. He says, but I don't have an answer for you today, but if you come back next week, I'll give you an answer. He said, I didn't think they ever would come back. He said, the next week they were sitting on the front row again. And so then he was like, okay, now I've got to give him an answer. So what's the answer going to be? He said, here's what it's all about. He said, without Christ, you're riding along, like let's say down in Kenston where it's flat, and it's, you're bumping up and down, bumping along on the bumpy roads out there. Or and with Christ, it's like being in Asheville. You're still going up and down, but you're a lot higher than you are without Christ. I mean, with Christ than without Him. You get that illustration he's saying? That's the difference. Christ is still with you. You still have that hope. You still have that knowledge that He's going to be there if you need Him. In verse uh, 29, He finally gives, this is the answer. But He is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcised of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter, and His praise is not from people, but from God. He says... Uh, you do what God, the little small voice tells you to do. You act on that. And you do that. And that's what it's about. It's not about trying to keep it. It's about the Spirit. I think of Jesus when He starts talking about in Matthew. And He's going through the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. And He's explaining all that. He said, you know, you say, well, I haven't killed anybody today, so I haven't broke that commandment. But if you got mad with somebody, you actually have killed them in your heart. And Jesus says there's more to it than you're trying to do because they wanted to... Have you ever been to school and the students come up front and they ask the professor, what's the least I can do to get a passing grade? That's what the Jews were looking at. What's the least I can do to get into heaven? Instead of, you know, what can I do to get closer to Jesus? The wrong question is what they were asking. And that's the way it is here. The Jew was that way. And he says it's the Spirit. It's just the daily walk doing what Jesus tells you to do, and keep following Him. Then in chapter 3, we're going to look at this chapter and close, and sort of skim through it. It says, then what advantage does the Jew have? You might say, well, none, but he does. He says, or what is the benefit of circumcision? And he talks about that later. He goes over something else right now. He says, in great in every respect, first, and he never got the number two, but he says, first, that they were entrusted with the actual words of God. They had the word. The, other, the Greeks and the Gentiles, they didn't have the word. But the Jews had the word. They could read it and they could see what God said. The Greeks and Jews could only hear, knew what people told them. And you know how it is when people tell stuff. It isn't always the whole truth. 
It gets mixed up. If you're sitting in one of those things and you start off and you tell something and it goes down a line, everybody's telling it, you get to the end, it's totally different. Because that's, that's the way it is with us. If it's written down, and the one thing I love about the Jewish people, when they took the Word, they were meticulous in making sure it was accurate. They would count each, each letter to make sure the letters were the same as the original. If they weren't the same, they'd tear it up and start over from the beginning. I don't know if I would have done that, but that's what they did. Uh, and then let's go to verse 9 and 10. It says, What then? Are we better than they? He said, Not at all, for we have already been charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one, no righteous person, not even one. You know, later on, he's, and I don't know if we'll cover that, we might. I uh, think so. You know, he's, he'll say that we've all sinned and falling short of the glory of God. Then verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. But it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. We all have that opportunity to be saved. We have to believe that Jesus was the one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. Being justified as a gift, it's not something we earn, it's something that God has given to us, which is in Christ Jesus. The only condition is that we except Jesus. That's the condition. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness. It's interesting, that word propitiation, you've seen a lot of people try to explain what it means. Most people say it's atonement. But if you look at the literal word here, it actually means mercy seat. You know, the mercy seat was the part where they would offer sacrifice and they'd come in with the blood into the most holy and they would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. What was underneath the mercy seat? The law of God. We had broken the law, but because of Christ's sacrifice, we received mercy instead of the penalty for the law. And that's what was going on. That's what he's alluding to here. Then he says in verse... um, 28. Or is it God, the God of the Jews only? He is not God of the Gentiles also. Yes, Gentiles also. He says, again, it's for everybody. And then the big thing the Judaizers had was that if you're going to knock all these laws off that we can't do, then we're not doing something right. You know, you're taking a, stripping away what they thought was salvation. He was saying it's Christ and Christ only. And they were having a hard time with it. So that's why he had to go through and tell them, you're sinners, <laughs> everybody can be saved. He had to really go through that. And finally he ends with this verse in chapter 3. Do we then nullify the law? Because they were saying, because you got grace, you're doing away with the law. It's just like nowadays when people say, we keep the law, that we must, not, we must be thinking we're saved by works. Hadn't you heard that from other churches? And they'll say, we're saved by grace. We're free. We can do whatever we want. And I think, well, have you read your Bible? I don't think you can do whatever you want. But we're all saved by grace. But because we're saved by grace, what what does he say here? Do we nullify the law through faith? Far from it. On the contrary, we establish the law. And there when it's talking about the law, it could be talking about the law, the Old Testament prophecies that they taught in the Old Testament. Remember, David said, cleanse me, and I will be made white as snow after he had sinned with Bathsheba. He knew he needed help. Or it could be the law that Moses gave, you know, the, the Torah. It's taking uh, the proper place of the law in salvation. The law exposes our sin. It shows us that we come up short. It condemns us, but then we have hope 
because Jesus paid the price. Or it could be the moral requirements, such as the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount. In this sense, we're saved by grace Christians will fulfill the just requirements of the law in their lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, which I believe it's all of them that he's talking about. Again, it's not what we do, it's what we allow God to do in us. And if you're like me, I never feel like I've done enough. That's one reason I became a pastor. I told my wife, I don't feel like I'm doing enough. I mean, I was, I was the elder in the church. I was giving Bible studies. And I still felt like I'm not doing enough. Because when we realize what Christ has done for us, we understand we can never do enough. And we do it out of gratitude because of what He has done for us. And I pray that, that as you think about this, that your heart will be humbled, that you'll have gratitude, and you'll say, I want to do something for you, Jesus. Tell me what you want me to do. And you'll go out and do it, and we'll see this church just explode at the seams. Because when you go out and you start showing kindness and helping people and studying with people and praying for people, things will happen. Because that's how it happened with apostles. They saw they were changed men. Because remember, they brought them in, and they said, Aren't these the ones that were with Jesus? <laughs> they weren't the same. They were changed. And that's what we want to be, don't we? We want to be changed. We want to be like the disciples were, going out and making a difference in the world. Let's sing our closing song as we ponder those things.